the landscaping unit, the uh, and you break it into its units. And then you zoom really close to that house and you see that that flooring unit is actually made of a quantity of different stuff. You got the carpet, the subfloor, the padding, the tacking strips, the glue, the nail, everything that would go into that unit. This would be custom homes. You know, there is no other Gernak home around, but we could use a Ron Wampler home and pull his plans and use them as the basis for this home because we know the value of that and had 2,000 two by fours, this one's got 2,100. So what do you do like, um, so like for instance, my in-laws live like out in the middle of nowhere and there's like some houses that are like near them, um, but they're like, I mean, their houses, they built their house and it's 4,000 square feet versus like the neighbor um built theirs i don't know how long before that and theirs is only two thousand square feet and like you know how how do you judge theirs when there's nothing else close to it that even compares to it that's why this is an art <laughs> you will get this those are called white elephant properties and that happens all the time and in the country, I heard you say one thing I want to make sure. In the country, you may go five miles. You may go 10 miles. If the property is sufficiently unique enough, it may warrant the entire state of Indiana. All right? It Once again, this is why it's an art. If you are asked to list Conseco's home when it went up for sale, how many houses have 17 bedrooms in it? There may not be another one within 50 miles. So when you start getting into properties that we call the white elephant, yes, difficulties arise. And you may go with a different method because you were talking about the substitution method. Maybe we go with the cost method because we use that 2,000 square foot house and say, well, it costs 20 grand to build, make up a number, but it's got X amount of two by fours. This one's got four times that. So I would multiply that number by four. This one's got three squares or shingles. This one's got four times that. So you may not use the substitution method if it's sufficiently unique enough. You may go to one of these others and use that house that was built 10 years ago, that's 2,000 square feet, and now you've got to manipulate, but you need the blueprints because you're going to do the quantity survey method and realize that 10 years ago, and we're going to talk about this thing called depreciation here in just a second, because in a house that was built 10 years ago, we may have to depreciate it and figure out what that cost would be today. So that's a very good point that you will run into that there are sufficiently unique properties called white elephants that you may have to, you know, five miles, 10 miles. Oh, there's one in Richmond. They actually, there was a commercial brokerage for fun, comped the White House. How many houses in the United States have more than 50 bedrooms? They use the entire United States as the comping area because they had to come up with a number of houses that had over 50 bedrooms. And there was like five that they found. Mm. So yeah, you're going to get into that. Hopefully it's not your first one you do. <laughs> All right, so that is the cost approach. Now, here's the problem with the cost approach that we just mentioned is that in some cases, we have to figure depreciation, all right? And depreciation 
is defined as, uh, let me see where we're at. Depreciation is the loss in value of a property for any reason. And when we calculate depreciation, we use this thing called straight line depreciation. Straight line means that it changes the same that the rise in the run, or they call that the slope, is the same every year, all right? So if we had a property that was valued at $30,000 and it has an economic life of 30 years. Now, time out, side note. This has to do with taxes and calculations and depreciation. It is not truly a loss in value because you will see here in a minute that this theory could be zero and there is no house that actually is worth zero, all right? That's the first thing. The second thing is everything in the world has an economic life according to the IRS. Computers, roofs, houses, roller skates, and it allows you to depreciate this item and the depreciation per year is defined as the dollars over the years. So in this specific case, what is the straight line depreciation of the property? Ten thousand. Exactly. I made easy numbers for everybody. You've got 300 grand divided by 30 years. That's $10,000 of depreciation per year. So if I ask you, what is the value of the property five years from today? What would you tell me? What is the property's value five years from today? $250,000? Exactly. It would be $250,000. If it depreciated $10,000 a year in five years, it would lose $50,000. Therefore, the value today would be worth $250,000. And it is a and it's straight line, meaning it's the same every year. And it's just the value divided by the economic life of a property. That's how we calculate straight line depreciation. Are we good? Thumbs up? Because there are a couple calculations in your homework. All right. Now that depreciation is a loss in value for any reason. And here are some of the reasons that you can lose value. The first one is called physical deterioration. Physical deterioration. Hey, the roof just went bad. Now, the good thing about physical deterioration is that it comes in curable and non-curable. Curable would be like, hey, the roof's bad. We just put a new roof on it. We've changed that deterioration. A non-curable or uncurable property might be where the value to fix it, let me, re say, let me restate that, the cost to fix it is greater than the value. My wife, I've taken my wife downtown several times and she literally cries when we go up College Avenue because those houses are 6,000, 7,000 square feet that are in such bad shape that the cost to fix it is gonna be well exceeding what you could sell it for. That would be a case of a non-curable physical deterioration. The cost is greater than the value. 
Yes, sir. How come banks don't just demo those type of houses? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. The biggest reason is it's not a loss on their books while it's still sitting there. Mm -hmm. They will get to depreciate it on their books. That's one major reason. If they demo it, then it's a loss and they have to write it off on their books. The other reason is typically maybe it's free and clear that no one owns it and they just don't want to bother with it because of the cost to fix it. All right. And literally a bank can't take it if they don't have a lien and the guy's not violated the lien. All right. Most of those are private owned, not necessarily bank owned. Shauna? Can we go back once one to the uh, depreciation? Sure. Because I missed something where you asked for five years and was it 240K then or was it 250? And how did we come to that? Because did we take three, 300,000? I hope I wrote 250. Yeah, I think you did. I wrote it down as 250. Am I taking the 300,000 yeah. and dividing that by five? Years? No, what I did was take if it depreciates ten thousand per year, yeah, times five years means it okay. loses fifty thousand dollars. It started okay. at three hundred. It's now fifty five years later worth two hundred and fifty. And that's okay. what I'm seeing when I drew this curve right here. You go up five years, hit that, and go over to that value. If we did ten years. It would be a hundred thousand depreciated, so now it's only worth two hundred k. Got it. All right. Got it. And yeah. Obviously, if you did thirty years, you could see thirty years times ten thousand is three hundred. That's where it crosses that line. It's worth zero. But once again, it's truly not worth zero. Okay. That's the depreciation on it. Thumbs up. There is a, another way a property can depreciate that is called functional obsolescence. Obsolescence is a real big fancy word, means that it has fallen out of favor by general concepts. Let me give you an example. One car garage is functionally obsolete. In the 40s and 50s, Wife stayed home, husband went to work, they only needed one car, therefore garages had one, or houses had one car garage. In today's world, people look at a one car garage and go, eh, nah, no, I'm not interested. You know, my wife's got a car, I've got a car, we need two car. Two bedroom house. Now it's three bedroom. Probably progressed into four bedroom houses. I had a house a number of years ago at 38th and Richard I listed. It was a four bedroom, one bath house. And the guy had three daughters. When we went to list his house, he's like, I said, four bedrooms, one bath. He's like, yeah, when I want to take a crap, I go to Speedway because he couldn't get it in the bathroom. That was a functionally obsolete house. Now we sold it, uh, but we probably sold it for way cheaper than a four bedroom, at least two bath house would have been. All right. So functional obsolete obsolescence is when it falls out of favor because of the functionality. One car garage, best example. The last way a property can be ex is externally obsolete. External obsolescence means something outside of the neighborhood or outside of the property, such as the neighborhood. Let me make sure I clarified that again. Something outside of the property, such as the neighborhood, would cause the prop house to be non-desirable. You can gold plate the doorknobs at a house at 46th and Post Road. It's still sitting at the murder, murder intersection of Indianapolis. It doesn't matter. 
that house has a problem, 